guys, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guest is one of the greatest, most uncompromising directors that has ever lived. His filmography includes titles like Monty Python and the Holy Grail, Time Bandits, Brazil, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, 12 Monkeys, and now he's brought a 30-year dream of his to the big screen. Terry Gilliam's The Man Who Killed Don Quixote, which will have a one-night theatrical Fathom event across the country tonight. In Quixote, Adam Driver plays a jaded advertising executive given new life when he's mistaken for Don Quixote's squire, Sancho Panza. Let's take a look. I was born by the special will of heaven to restore the lost age of chivalry. I am Don Quixote de la Mancha. <laughs> and cut right there. Good work. I want to drop some of the shots. Why? Because it isn't working. Because my client isn't happy. Because the whole concept is ridiculous. You are Don Quixote. It's your concept, it's your vision. I want you to keep an eye on her. Do that for me. I'm the boss's wife. <gasps> Jackie! Oh! Javier? Sancho? You crazy peasant. You think you can hide from me? We shall have such great adventures together. I am Don Quixote de la Mancha, and I command you to release my squire. Don Quixote? Wow! Now he actually believes he's Don Quixote. This is going to be fun. Don Quixote de la Mancha. Come to restore the lost age of chivalry. Well, I wrote that. Blasphemer! Can I read? <laughs> the peasant like you has not to read. I will sound the words, and you can look at the pictures. I really like your big adventures, Don Quixote. He's probably wet himself. I don't like this. Why does everything always have to be about you, Sancho? Oh. Me, 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 me. I am Don Quixote. Everybody put your hands together for the man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> Terry Gilliam. Thank you, yeah. Let's be a sir. So nice to have you here. Thank you for being here. Well, I loved the fact that we saw the trailer in French. Yes, that it's is a very sophisticated audience. Exactly. You have that's here. what we like want them it. to. If they don't know French, we want them to learn. And we I, want them I've to learn. A few words, yeah. So I have to ask. You know, I want to talk about the movie itself uh, and the story, but uh, obviously, thirty years to make this film. What causes a man to work for 30 years to get a project off the ground? What was it about this story itself? Because I imagine you have lots of other ideas that you pitch. They go nowhere. You don't do them. You pitch a different one. That's the life of a movie maker. Yeah. Why the man who killed Don Quixote is something that plagued you for 30 years? It's. I'm not sure if I made the choice. I think I was possessed is what it was. I was a victim of a Spanish writer who died centuries ago. It's very, you've got to be very careful what you read. And certain books uh, do not just obsess you, they start possessing you. The idea, the character, what the character represents, and, and then slowly you become that character. I'm afraid what happens. And Coyote's all about a dreamer. He, he's a dreamer, he's a madman, he's a lunatic. He, his view of the world was completely uh, thrown into chaos by reading books of chivalry, honor, you know, heroism, maidens in distress, very noble ideas. And he sets out to live those ideas and of course he's constantly smashed to the ground by reality and yet he keeps getting back up. Is there a part of you that sees the duality of Driver's character and Price's Quixote as versions of yourself? Like, you are not just Quixote in this movie, but you are also the advertising director, or the, the big Hollywood movie director, and then the chaos maker at the same time? I don't know. I didn't actually think of it that way, but Tony Grazzoni, who, who I wrote with, he said when people started saying, Gilliam is Quixote, blah, 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 all that stuff, he said, no, the film is Quixote. Film, the film is the dream. I am Sancho Panza. <laughs> I'm yeah. the guy that picks up the dirt and keeps it moving, yeah. That was sort of what I took from this as well, that like you as the filmmaker, Quixote is not just 
this film, he's any movie, he is the dream to make any kind of movie and what sort of wrangling and horror it takes to keep that thing in check. Yeah, and the thing that's unique about Coyote is he never gives up. He keeps sm being smashed. It's, he's more like Sisyphus, pushing the rock up the mountain, it rolls back. Like many and, a director would say making a movie is like. <laughs> and I surround myself with it reasonable people who say stop do something else and i don't like reasonableness i think it limits the way we look at the world i think the whole thing is almost every film i've done has had a madman in it somebody or a child somebody who doesn't know the limitations of reality and i think that's important to maintain and try to encourage other people to approach life that way do you think your obsession because as you said you didn't necessarily self-analyzed too much as to why you were possessed with this. Yes. Do you think it may have had anything to do with the the filmmaking metaphor of the of the whole thing that you had tried so hard with movies like Brazil and Fear and Loathing and Time Bandits and Baron Munchausen to push these things up the hill and try to wrangle your imagination into something that was coherent for yeah. no, no, that's commerce? A, that's a nice way. I think because, yeah, those other films, I suppose, were tra in tra I was in training for Quixote, the Quixote experience, because all of them were difficult. They all had their own various problems. And you keep marching on. I mean, filmmaking is not a right, let's say. You've got to earn it. You've got to actually go for it and believe in it. And I, I, I actually want to encourage other people to assume life should be done like this. Mm -hmm. You know, I hate that song, The Impossible Dream, from <laughs> Man of La Mancha, but there is that. The improbable is interesting to involve yourself in. The impo impossible is even more interesting. <laughs> I'm wondering, you know, there's a sequence within this film, it's very early on in the beginning when Adam Driver, who has become a somewhat jaded advertising executive, a big director, always over budget, doesn't really care that much about the product that he's making, which you have never been as a director, but he looks at uh, a copy, he gets a bootleg copy of this film that he made very early on in his career, it's what starts his whole journey in this, and he is struck by not the vision that he had as a young filmmaker, but the energy and the innocence that he had. Do you ever feel that when you look back on your early films? Do you ever look back on your early films? I don't watch them. I, I like people coming forward and saying how wonderful they are. It's safer <laughs> Anybody than actually like watching them. forward and say how wonderful <laughs> they are? That's a call to action. But when I do actually get around to watching them, I'm always disappointed, Namely, I, I see the flaws is the problem. It's not that, and no, at the same time, I, I look and say, how, how can I say fuck on this program? Oh, yeah. Okay, how the fuck did Gilliam do that? Because I don't know how to do that anymore. It's the advantage of youth. And you make those flaws? No, to did... make, no, the good bits. Oh, the good? <laughs> <laughs> I know why I make the flaws, but the good bits, I, I don't know how I imagined them and how I achieved them. It's quite interesting. Uh, and that always surprises me. So, uh, in, in fact, about two weeks ago, they're doing an upgraded version of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and I hadn't seen it in years. And we, we were doing the grading, and just with the images, no sound. And I said, this is great. This is an incredible film. This is amazing. And at the same time, how the fuck did I do it? <laughs> is was my reaction. And I, I'm intrigued by that, because I like the fact that you know, it's what I always do with my films. I don't want, I get so involved with them. I'm hoping that 10 years later, I will watch them and it'll be a complete surprise to me. I would like to be like the normal audience that goes in with no idea of what they're going to see and either get blown away or, yeah, why did they bother doing that? Either way, I don't care what the response is as long as there is a response. When I think of fear and loathing, I think of an obsession with wide angle lenses and fisheye lenses, which sort of began early in your career, but fear and loathing is really where it reached the yeah. kind of like, apex where you're like, I am going to blow this out as much as possible. I love these lenses. But it also lended itself well to the yeah. Ralph Stedman, uh, was yeah. Stedman, right? The, yeah, correct, and, yeah. the illustrations from the book. No, but that's that's why watching it was so exciting again, because that is not what I've done on Coyote. We've, mm -hmm. tr because a fantasist a work, a dreamer, so I wanted it to be completely in the real world. It's textures, real textures. We're not building sets. We're on real places. We're vulnerable to the uh, variabilities of nature, and that was what seemed to be important. There's no, there's very, there is CG work in, but not in the way it's used in Avengers, X Men, all that stuff. Right, and within with with Quixote, you're not doing. I mean, in in Fear and Loathing, 
yes, it's all one hallucination in a way, but it's very clearly a hallucination. With Quixote, the fantasy doesn't necessarily, uh, it's not that different looking than, than the reality or when, when reality and fantasy happens. Well, in a sense, there is isn't fantasy yes. in Quixote. That's what's interesting. I've, re I've read the reviews that talk about, they can't tell what's real, what is, but what we're doing is, it's a real world, and Quixote's view of that world becomes more real to Tony, to mm -hmm. Toby, sorry, the Adam Driver character. It's about Adam being taken, dra dragged out from his cynicism and his limited view of the world anymore back into the world of imagination, but it's always the real world that seems to be transforming as opposed to anything else. Do you, I mean, even just reading how this film got made, behind the scenes, just in terms of finding the financing and then it falling through. You've done a num countless interviews about that already. I don't want to get into the, the, the weeds on that. Everybody can go look it up. It's all over the internet. <laughs> I'm wondering if you ever found yourself like, if that's where you find yourself like Toby, is when you're in that part of the filmmaking process, you feel cynical and jaded and it's when you get to set or when you get into post that you get to feel a little more like Quixote. I don't know, it's, it's, it's always odd. There's, there's different stages in filmmaking. It's when you're writing it, of course, everything is possible. Then you get down to looking for locations and dealing with budgets, and now what is possible is reduced. Uh, and what happens at that point is, I find always interesting when we start shooting because of the limitations. I can't do that. The, we, it was in the script, we've run out of time and money, we can't do it. And I rail against those restrictions, but more often than not, the solution to the problem becomes more interesting than what we wrote on the page. And I really believe that. There's, there's, I don't want to be able to make a film with $150 million. It's too unlimited. I mean, I want things that are containing me, restricting me. It's how you make good bombs, what? frankly. <laughs> That's how a bomb works. Constrain a grenade, hold it all, squeeze it in there, okay, bang. It was all about limitations for Ted Kaczynski. That's where he really thrived. Um, what, what was the highest budget you ever had to work with on a movie? What movie for you had the highest budget? Brothers Grimm. Brothers Grimm. 72 million. And did you feel like there were very little limitations in there? And did you feel like a little lost while you were making that? No, the limitations were the Weinstein brothers. They came in <laughs> to limit what we can do because they were desperate to control me. Mm. And if you're a smart producer, you try to give me what I need and let me be the responsible one. I will control myself. And they, of course, did what they did. They fired my cinematographer, Nicola Pecorini. And the whole thing was, as I said at the time, the Weinsteins took the joy of filmmaking away from me. What more do you ask for? Was it harder? Was it after after that film was done? Was it hard to get back in the cellar, or did you want to start making stuff right away? No, I I was very keen to keep working, but it was just the fact that you do that, you work with people like that. What made it not just bearable? What made it was each day that made the, it was worth coming to work was Heath, Matt, because and the crew, which were wonderful, and that's what you do. But something very deep was removed, and so. I wasn't playing. And what we do, making films as far as I'm concerned, is we're allowed to play. I, I like to be the guy that builds the sandbox mm -hmm. and uh, put the limitations on it. But me, the actors, we're like children. We're highly paid children is what we are. <laughs> Um, the film, your, the first iteration that you tried to shoot was like 1991-ish, right? And then it was 2002-ish where you got flooded out. Yeah. Literally the nature yeah. <laughs> was thwarted you. And now you made it, you shot it two years ago. How has the script changed over those 30 years? How many different kinds of drafts? How have you thought about it differently? How often did you go back in and rewrite it? Well, I mean, it's at the beginning after I had got, here's how... 1989, we finished Munchausen, and I called up the uh, executive producer, a man named Jake Ebers, a very good, wonderful man. And I said, Jake, I need $20 million. I've got two names for you. One is Gilliam, and the other is Coyote. And he says, done, you got the money. That's how it started in 89. <laughs> filmmaking ruled in 1989, it sounds. <laughs> and then, of course, somebody from another company came along and said, we'll give you $25 million. What? This is incredible. And I go to Jake and say, Jake, what? He said, they got more money? Go with him. And I went with them, and, and months were spent uh, working, discussing, moving forward. And then they pulled the plug. So... Boom, dead. Now we start again. And when we got around to the version with Johnny, we had 
at that point, $32 million. The one we've just done that you saw bits of was made for 20. Right. So I'm back to where I started in 89. <laughs> but when you, in, in those periods of time before shooting, were you changing the script and rewriting? Yeah. I mean, th that's, what I, that's the part. Thank you for answering. Oh, yeah, Ask no it problem. again. <laughs> I had got lost there in my answer. Uh, it, the, Charles McKeon and I sat down to write it because I hadn't read the book when I got the money. So first, <laughs> first have you the eye. You read the book? No. No, but I knew, we all know about Coyote. We don't know about Coyote, believe you me. And so we sit down and- Yeah, it's a big book. It is big, it's not a one, but it's two books. One written in 1605 and the other written 1615, 10 years later. And it's extraordinary. And Charles McEwen, who had written Munchausen with me, we sat down, what the fuck are we going to do with this? How do you, how do you squeeze it into a couple hours of filmmaking? And the original script was basically in a little Spanish village and sitting around the, the, the plaza there were old men and all they kept doing, they're having their drinks, all day. if only it was the thing, if only I had done this, if only I hadn't done that, if only she hadn't done that. Uh, and you're, it's all the oh, if onlyness. And one of those guys just got tired of living his life, living the if only life. And Okay, and he started reading, of course, he reads, and that's what Coyote does, and suddenly he's reading about knights, and, and it's, it was gonna be his last hurrah, it basically is what we were writing, and that's how it grew. But then, I was bothered, I, don't, I just felt there was something that we couldn't, for a modern audience, wouldn't understand the difference in costumes and everything between the 17th century Spain and 12th century Spain, which is where the stories take place. And so let's have a modern man involved. And that became the character that Johnny Depp was playing in the version. He was an advertising guy. He wasn't actually a director. He was just a, in advertising. Was that a part of the original script when you got the money in 89? Or was that something that then came for the, jo for the version with Johnny? That came with the version with Johnny. Wow. Because, you know, that, so basically 10 years elapsed while we were working in towards that okay, script. You didn't even have a, fin a script in 89 when, you, when you got the money. Not oh. even the book. I had to go and buy the book. <laughs> That's a hustler. That's a hustler right there. <laughs> and and, and so, so we got it up to Johnny's thing. And, but, but the story then was more like Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court. Mm -hmm. You know, guy gets bumped on the head, ends up in the Middle Ages, and, and he would be then with the real Don Quixote. And that's what we set off to do. And of course, five days in, we were finished. Uh, and then there was a period where we had to wait to eventually get the script back from the insurance company on the Johnny version. That took several years. And, and then when we got that back, it was time to start reading what we'd written and see where to go. And at that point, Tony Grizzoni and I had been working together and on he came and slowly we started to shift it. And at each iteration of this film, I kept trying to fool myself into thinking we're doing something new and fresh. So it's not just some old idea that I'm clinging desperately to. We keep trying to reinvigorate the thing. And it was only in the last, I don't know, probably was six, seven, eight, eight years when it go. I have no sense of time anymore, that the idea of seeing Toby having made a film 10 years earlier when he was innocent, pure, come out of film school, doing something for all the right reasons, and then because of the success of that, he was lured into making commercials where it's much easier, lots of money, and... It was really then a story about a man who betrayed his talent is what we got into. I thought that's really good. And in the previous versions, we had always been struggling with the Dulcinea character. Uh, and in, in Cervantes' version, you know, she's basically a peasant whore is what she is. Um, and we could never get this one right. And finally, with this 10 years earlier version, uh, we had Angelica, 15-year-old girl and a village, village girl. And, and of course, she is told you could be a star, just be yourself. And she goes off to be a movie star. She goes to the big town, it never goes right. And she ends up uh, f quite fallen, as we say. And, and so she's been corrupted by the dream, I suppose, and, and the reality. And, and then we had the 
character that Jonathan is playing as Quixote, a shoemaker. These are village people who have no interest in acting or movies. Suddenly they're draw, brought into the world of movie making. And that became really interesting, what that does to people, how we, we corrupt each other in this way. It's, it's a world that can change your life for better or worse. And I always think about that when you see non-actors cast in like big roles in movies mm. and everyone talks about them and loves them yeah. and they go on like an Oscar campaign or something and my, I'm just going like, oh my God, please let this work out well for them in the end somehow. Well, well that was like, the, I mean, having done Time Bandits with Craig Warnock, he was a, a kid, 10 years, 11 years old, and he went, he was going to be a doctor. He then went into rock and roll music, and I don't know where he is now, and you kind of worry. Joe Del Furland in Thailand, Thailand was you know, nine and a half years old. I mean, she did have a career in movies. I really have lost track with Joe Del, but it's very worrying what we do, uh, the cost of people's lives, making movies. And then it became also about what movies do to people now. And I thought, okay, we don't read like we used to read. And Avengers, X-Men, all that stuff, are they the same kind of sources of inspiration that books of chivalry were to Quixote? Are they these the things you want to go and be heroic like action, various action men? And what does that do? Are they for you? No, I don't like them because they're too... They're not normal people. They're freaks or superheroes. I like that's what intrigues me about Quixote. He's real. He's flawed like everybody is, without any special powers. And that interests me more than guys with infinite superpowers. Uh, it's just. And I I was talking about this earlier, and it does the question: What happens if you're a kid and you can't do all those things that you have watched and admired on film? Do you become frustrated? Do you become angry at your impotence, your inability to do these heroic things? And out of frustration, do you show that you've got a little power by taking a gun and walking into the classroom? I don't know if there's a connection. It makes me wonder. I don't really know what the effect is. I know what movies did to me. Uh, Paths of Glory, I was 13 years old and saw the Kubrick film. And suddenly, movies weren't just Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis comedies. Right. Suddenly they were about injustice and other things, and and that made me go off in a direction. It was, I think, a good direction, but I, I worry about fantasy. <laughs> yeah, so do I. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm curious. There's a, and this quote may be off. There's a Vincent Minnelli film called The Bad and the Beautiful from, from back in the yeah. day about filmmaking and about Hollywood, and I believe it's Kirk Douglas's character who's the big producer, and he's just labored over this big movie that he's made, and he's finished it. He's coming down the stairs, and he's miserable, and he's depressed, and I think his wife looks at him, and he, she says, what's wrong? And he says, leave me alone. There's nothing, like, there's nothing more depressing than finishing a movie. Right. Now, that's a movie that he made, took like two years to make within this, right. the character of this movie. This took 30 years. When you finish this, when you locked cut, what did that feel like to you? Was it, re was it relief or it was, was it Thank depression? God, yes. The brain tumor has been removed and the patient is alive. Has it though, really? <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it was, I mean, it was like, I, it, that was my joke for a long time saying, I'm suffering from a brain tumor, and unless I get the thing excised, I cannot get on with the rest of my life. I mean, all films, you, when you finish, there's postnatal depression. You go into it, I'm used to it, and you have to live through the depression. You can't rush into depression. You've How long does it normally last you? Uh, it could be months, six months sometimes. You know, you've got to hit the bottom before you start... Boy, becoming buoyant again. Uh, this is just a very different one because I said in interviews b before the film was finished, what's it going to be like afterwards? I said, the void. It'll be the void. <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> I don't have a clue in my head of what I want to do now. I have nothing. Zero. Really? I'm not depressed. I'm just kind of fine. This is very strange. There's nothing waiting to lure me into more filmmaking or lure me into anything. What do you do when you're in those, when you're in those periods of time? Because you're a creative guy and filmmaking takes, you know, a lot of money, a lot of time, yeah, a yeah. lot of people. So yeah. how do you exercise your creativities when you're in that void? Do you? Yeah, I've, I've got a house in Italy and I spend a lot of time building stone walls. Really? Yeah, it's very good. Just sheer manual labor. And I've gotten too old to lift those stones down. That's my problem. I think it's age that finally got me down. <laughs> Get some other people to build the stone walls for you and just watch it's not, them. It's not the same. Yeah. It's the business of going out there and putting that one on top of that one and that one would look better if it was over this one. 
it's it's like a kind of a form of sculpture. And it's, it's, I like building, my father was a carpenter, so I've always been about making things. I, I just, I don't even call, even call myself a filmmaker. I'm a craftsman, I'd like to be. Just a guy who can make things, that's it. You know, your films have always been wild and extraordinary, and I think also, loose is the wrong word, but at the same time, they don't conform to very clear standards of what people think a movie should be, even though you do have structures mm. to yeah, your yeah. stories, because they are stories. Do you think that we've reached a strange time with filmmaking or movies where not even just mainstream audiences, but critics have a very weird expectation of what a movie has to be or should be? Yes, I actually think it is like that. What I loved about coming up, and especially in like the 60s, it was when foreign movies started pouring into America. You were seeing completely different structures, different rhythms, different kinds of acting, and every time I went to the cinema, it was exciting. I wonder if The Godfather came out right now, right? If, if critics would be like, could have lost 30 minutes, really. Like. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's it. I do feel films, the structure has become more and more like a pop song, mm -hmm. is what it feels like. We know what a good pop song is, but other than is the middle eight, and, blah, blah, and movies are more and more like that. It's even, okay, I'm gonna be something very specific good friend of mine, a man I admire enormously, is Guillermo del Toro. And The Shape of Water. I saw it when we were finishing Kyori, and I thought, I'm watching a movie, and it's really good, but it's a movie. Yeah. And that's it, and it fits within the confines of what a movie is. And I then was looking at what we were doing on Kyori, and I said, Wow, it's not a movie. That's all I can say. Yeah, there's <laughs> no good. there's no room for tangents yeah. in movies anymore, right? Like, and that's what the shit. Like you said, it's a pop song. A pop song doesn't have a tangential space that it goes into. Scorsese can still somehow yeah. work it in in yeah. some way, and you're really working in that form yeah. as well. But you've said that you've been, you know, nonplussed by some of the critical response to it. Yeah, I mean, I. But that's my history from the beginning, almost the reviews have been black or white. There's very little middle ground. I mean, I suppose with age, and I'm supposed to be a respected filmmaker now, there's more middle ground. They're fudging their bets. They, really, they don't want to say the guy's lost it completely yet. They don't say that. Except one did. I read one last night. <laughs> and it's, it's like... Fuck that guy. Yeah, but, I like, but I like... I want responses from what I do. What I hate is a guy come, come out after a screening and say, yeah, it was all right. That's like die, Terry. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm actually, my movies are designed to make after film dinners more interesting for people who have come to see the films so they can argue vehemently with each other about what the movie was about. Was it any good? Did you hate this? Discussing. I think I'm good for dinner conversations and my films are. Do you find um, that when you get on set, you have a different approach to filmmaking than when you than you did maybe in in the eighties at all, do you find that you have more or less fight in you? I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I have much difference. I I used to storyboard my things much more, and now I don't. And particularly Quixote. I mean, the whole thing about wide angle lenses and interesting angles. I'm not doing it in Quixote. I'm shooting it very normally. There's a very, there's a few really. I mean, there's some moments that are like, oh, it's a Gilliam angle, like yeah, right know. there. I but just for the most part, I lose control. <laughs> but you're right, absolutely. For the most part, it is a very, uh, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to put it down anyway because it's so beautifully shot. Yeah. But it's not the but wild. Yeah, we're not using wide angle lenses in the way I usually use them. I'm not using bizarre angles. I'm just saying, this is just all normal, folks. We're in a lovely location. Let's enjoy that. Just the fact that what you're seeing doesn't look real. It's absolutely real. I was just trying to maintain that way of doing it so that me, the director, is not getting in the way. But isn't that such a strange thing to do for what many expected to be, <laughs> expect to be your, your yeah. magnum opus? Yeah. To not go into it and be like, this is everything Terry Gilliam has been working towards for his entire career to be like, no, yep. this is a naturalistic approach. to. I'm my perverse. Material. I've always been perverse. I shall continue till I'm dead. <laughs> I, I just, it was kind of like that. Yeah. How do you do it? Cause I know how Terry Gilliam would have done it normally. And I'm not going to do it that way for better or worse. I'm just going to see if I can work in. Basically I was just following the actors at, to me, after the first few days of shooting, I still wasn't certain if I had a good handle on what I was doing. 
but I knew the acting was great. And these, that's all I wanted to do is not get in the way of them, not impose any odd angles or anything on them. Just let them do the work and I will tag along yeah. and put it on film, that's all. You know, and that said, we haven't spoken at all about the actors. Adam Driver and Jonathan Price are amazing in the film. Um, I think Adam Driver is maybe the best young, best new young actor working right now. He makes everything he does look effortless on screen. Yep. You can never see him acting. Exactly. Uh, what was it like working with him? What was your What was your guys' collaboration like? I said, when are you going to start acting, Adam? I can never see him acting. <laughs> That's a lie. <laughs> uh, now, I love the fact that I actually, in the end, we begin to see Adam is the best reactor we've ever met. Because he's up against Stellan Skarsgård, Jonathan. At the beginning of the whole process, we were shooting out of continuity. And the first scenes are all Jonathan's scenes for the first week almost. And Adam, who knew the film, is on his shoulders. He felt the weight of that enormously. That's what was interesting. Because he's incredibly, he's so grounded. He's so solid. He's so the right guy, he's fantastic, I love him. And anyway, Jonathan comes bursting on the set and he's outrageous, he's getting laughs, the crew's laughing, and Adam is kind of like, for the first few days, what the fuck is going on here? And he settled into it, but it was, it was very interesting to watch how he settled in and what he chose to do and never try to compete with Jonathan. He just found this space that Jonathan couldn't get to. Is that a space that he had to work out with you that he talked to you about, or you just sort of saw him no, doing on his own? We don't have time to talk. Just shoot. Do the stuff. <laughs> Action. Cut. Come on, let's keep... No. We, we don't talk that much. We do it in rehearsal and reading through at the beginning. As we sit down and go through it, Jonathan, Joanna, who plays Angelica, Adam and I were just going through stuff. And very quickly you see rhythms and, mm -hmm. and reactions. And, and one of the things that came out of that is the end of the film, where I think I can give it away. Um, Coyote dies. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it isn't, but Coyote never dies. That's the key at the end of the film. And we were reading the end where, where Adam is riding off into the sunset as Don Quixote. Maybe he's gone completely crazy. Who knows? You'll find out. Uh, and he's saying this dialogue, which is quotes from what Coyote had been saying earlier in the film. And as we were reading it through, Jonathan, who has to steal every scene he can, even in just a read through, and, and Adam's saying the lines, I said, Adam, say it kind of in Jonathan's voice with a Spanish accent, and Adam started to do it, and then Jonathan just joined in, and the two voices were blending, and I said, that's the end of the film, and when you see the film, that is what happens. And that's when you're working with great actors who are willing to just play around, as we do, and you find a moment that we hadn't written that came out of that. You hadn't written that no, at all. No, and it was really good. And the ending, the ending is a surprisingly beautiful ending for a film of mine. You know, this is, I mean, it's wild to me that you would labor 30 years on a project and still be able to find the space on the set mm -hmm. where you're allowing the ending to create itself mm -hmm. in a way rather than being painstakingly yeah. deciduous about like this is what I wrote and this is yeah. what it has to be how do you still how do you maintain that open space in your head when you have to be protective of the material after 30 years but that's I suppose I was trying not to be, be so protective I know what I'm trying to do I, I know what I don't want to do let's put it that way you close those doors and within that there's many ways you could approach a scene or the relationships and and when you put the right people together, because I think if I got any real skill, it's choosing the right actors. And it's happened on too many of the films. And it's done rather instinctively. I just, I get this guy. I like it. And and then you put them together, and then you watch how things develop. And all I can say, that's too much of that. Or don't do that. Or look that way. But I don't interfere much. I, I just become, hopefully, a good audience. Yeah. And when they're funny, I laugh. When they're tragic, I cry. That's how it goes. <laughs> Can I ask, without naming names, obviously, have you ever cast the wrong person? And what is that like when that happens? Yes, I did. In Jabberwocky, the first one, on my own, one of the merchants in it, is, I won't name his name, uh, but there's a scene where he wakes up, and the way I was doing it was uh, you just see a hand in the darkness, and... Um, 
the light, uh, you hear a curtain open, a bit of light goes on the hand. The hand's been sort of like, uh, no, actually, we'd see the hand. In fact, I used it later in Time Madness. The hand is. <laughs> The light comes on, and then the hand starts, as you do in the morning, scratch, scratch, and then it hits, and it goes in the nose and digs around and finds a little booger. And as we do that, we pull out and reveal who it is. <laughs> now, the day we were shooting this, the actor, and it's been in the script, all written very carefully, storyboarded, and he says, I'm not going to do it. He says, what do you mean I'm going to do it? No. I'd rather, you know, I'd rather scratch my balls than do that on film. And it became a huge battle, and it was a movie, and we were always limited. In, I'm always fighting against time. Every, and some, of course. The whole crew waiting, and this guy is not going to do the scene as written. And then there's a, a nurse in the scene, the one that opened the curtains. Oh, I'm with him, too. I think it's disgusting picking your nose. And they're all ganging up on me. And in the end, we didn't do it. I just cut it out, and we did something else. But it, it was... That's the only time I've ever had this problem. Right. Uh, that must have been a huge lesson for you moving forward that, like, if you agree to do what's in the script, that's in the script and we're doing this. There is that. But when you do that on Fisher King, I won't name another name, but there's uh, an actress who was supposed to be a shower scene. Okay. And when uh, she was, uh, like all the others, coming forward uh, for the part, and there was her, all, all the photos in her book and there were a whole lot of naked photos in it which is one way to get the job and <laughs> and it was actually at least she's a good body and if we're gonna have to do a naked shower scene fine so that was all talked about discussed on the day no I'm not gonna do it mm -hmm. and it became a huge battle the producers were on the phone to her agent da, da, da. in the end there's a certain point you say all right we just move on it's not about being in total control, it's just try to get the movie made. And so, found a way of shooting it, not the way it was written, but we got something. And the so, movie still turned out great. Yes, because Jeff does what Jeff does, and Robin does what Robin does. And Mercy, no, we had a great cast. Uh, the, the the five leads: Jeff Bridges, Mercedes Rule, Robin, and uh, Amanda Plummer, and Michael Jeter, the brilliant Michael Jeter. You can't go wrong with a cast like that, despite my best efforts. <laughs> uh, I think we have some time for our audience questions. Who has a question? So right here, hi. Hey, Terry, pleasure to be here. Um, on this film, any of your other films, uh, do you prefer to work in the video village with the monitors or by the camera? And I'm wondering if, like Peter Weir, you ever play live or recorded music on the set to set the mood, thanks. I've never actually done the mood music, uh, unless there's a dance sequence like in Grand Central Station, then we gotta have music, sorry. <laughs> uh, but I don't, I've never done mood music. Uh, I tend to try to have a little monitor I can carry around so I'm not stuck back in Video Village and I can be right next to the camera because I want to be close to the actors because I'm the audience and there's the camera and so I'm usually carrying something around like that. It's the way it works. I just want to be able to see them close up. Uh, it's safer back in Video Village, of course, because then you can be, I don't want to name names of some of the great uh, directors who live in Video Village and it works for them because I did it once with one of the great directors and he invited me into his little video village and they're big screens it's you're watching a movie and in some ways that's very good because you can see this is a movie as opposed to just the person there and that relationship but i like the relationship of me being there and able to talk and, and hopefully be the good audience that they need oh, that's all there's also something urgent and immediate about holding your image as well and being able, you can almost feel yourself being like moving the camera yourself when you've yeah. got that image in your hand. Yeah. You know how you want to cut eventually. And it, I don't have to shout at Nicola because I can just say, Nicole. Oh, no. Do you even, do you keep a video village though for the producers or anything as well? I, I was, hate it. I was talking to someone today who yeah. was on Tarantino's new film mm. and they said that he doesn't keep a video village at all. The, the monitor is in his hands and he's the one looking at the image. So there's no producers or anybody there on their phones looking at the in video village or anything. I don't have so much of video, but there's always 
a monitor somewhere, and there's always a producer somewhere, and I, I let them look. I don't care. I just don't listen to them. That's all. <laughs> it's. I mean, I did. I did a commercial years ago. I think 2002 it was for Nike for the World Cup, and I hated it. I just hate because there's all these advertising guys there's around, and what they're worried about has nothing to do with. It's so minuscule, minute. Oh, there's a shoelace untied, probably. And I was, Fuck off, you know. We, well, there's we two things going on there with advertising, right? There's, sure, they're worried about a shoelace and stuff, but they're also worried about, like, my boss is here. I should show that I know what to do back here in this video village. So there's lots of people justifying their jobs rather than being part of the creative yep. process at all. Well, uh, what I did with these guys, because I was having such a bad time, being paid an enormous amount of money to have a really bad time was what That's was why happening. they pay you the money. <laughs> Ten days of hell. And I said, well, you guys know this stuff because it had to do with football. Uh, uh, and uh, we had the biggest football players, uh, uh, soccer players in the world in there. And they were all, uh, do this. And I said, finally, I said, guys, I think you know the stuff better than I do. You direct it. I'll just run the cameras. And that's what I did. Really? I didn't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Still got paid. Yeah, it was simply that. You guys want that? Well, go ahead. Do it. I've done it twice on commercials. <laughs> Because otherwise, just you've hired me, you're paying me a lot of money, then just let me do what I do. Right. That's all. Better than fighting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next question. Hi. So, Hi. Terry, in retrospect, three decades have passed. Mm -hmm. Are you happy that it's taken this journey, the film? No, I hate that I've wasted so much of my life. <laughs> I'm just pleased that I like the film. That's what it's about, that at the end of it, I haven't wasted all those years. I like what we've done. On the other hand, I just look at that film as something we have did in the last couple of years. Forget about all the other stuff. That's something else. It's what happened when we actually got the money and we started shooting. And within that time, a lot of things changed. While you're shooting, you have to adjust, you're doing all. The film is taking on a different life, its final life, ultimately. The final one in the editing room, of course, when I'm cutting and throwing everything out. But it's that, that's, so all those years preceding, I don't even think about them, to be honest. Because that said, with the exception of the, the six days that were chronicled in Lost in La Mancha, yeah. I would imagine that there's been a number of movies over the course of your 30 mm. year career that haven't been made. That you start, like you started pre production or they got to a certain place in terms of getting financing and then they just sort of fell apart and you moved on and did something else. Yeah, and somewhere in there, I got Brothers Grimm, Tideland, and Zero Theorem. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Terry, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. A real honor to have you on this oh, stage. Thanks. Congratulations on the film. I loved it. It's a thanks. it's a one night uh, only theatrical screening. Fathom tonight. In fact, what time is it now? It's supposed to go on at seven thirty tonight. I don't know if you have your. You've got about yet. three and a half hours to get there. It's the only big screens. What's actually what is happening? There's this across the nation. I think there's eight hundred screens, something like that, and it all goes on at seven thirty. I think at night. That's it. But in couple weeks on the 19th is it it's going to be back in 10 cities new york of course is one of them and it'll be on video demand on the same day so you can just go straight to your dvds or your streaming or you can go to see it on a big screen go see it on the big screen <laughs> guys the the man the myth the legend terry gilliam let's hear it <laughs>